Well, welcome once again to the 3ABN Worship Center this wonderful Sabbath afternoon. And if you're joining us from Australia, it's already Sunday. But uh, bear with us as we enjoy, as the Sabbath continues to carry on, and with it the blessing once again that Pastor James Rafferty will bring to us as we walk again together through the pages of the book of Revelation, and importantly, how to be prepared for these events that are coming upon the world. We must go to the Lord in prayer. We must ask for God's leading and guiding for these final movements we can see will truly be rapid ones. Stay with us for this next hour or so as we open the Word of God together. But before we do that, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Gracious Father in heaven, how wonderful it is to know that you loved us so much. You sent us a message for these last days through your faithful servant and prophet, John on the island of Patmos, and Lord, as we look through the pages that chronicle the heartbeat of America and the world, we pray that as we see these frightful events transpiring before our eyes, that we will look to you and be saved. Father, think not so much of the price of the amenities and the luxuries around us, but may our focus, on, may our focus be on the great high price you paid for our salvation. Bless your servant as he breaks the bread of life and strengthen us that we may find light in these dark times. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I have the privilege of ending these meetings with a song that really encapsulates what I've just uh, uttered in my prayer. You know, when you think of what the world is calling us to purchase and buy and what we're paying our lives for and whether high interest rates or all of our investments, think of what Jesus paid for us. And if you think of the great price he paid for us, it should activate us by his grace to serve him, to love him, and to live for his glory because he paid so high a price. Tell this 
Amen. Praise God. That is really probably the most important truth that we can study here in this series on prophecy. And we've been looking at a lot of important and significant truths, haven't we? But there's none that is greater than the cross. In fact, that's where we're going to be landing this ship, this plane, in our last meeting, how to prepare for final events. And really, there's only one way to get ready, get ready, get ready, and that is to connect with Jesus. That's really what it's all about. That's what prophecy is all about. I know that we have spent a lot of time emphasizing, you know, the, the events and things that are happening. We've looked at Revelation. We've looked at Daniel. We've looked at Matthew and Mark and Luke, and we've highlighted certain key prophetic declarations that God has made that I think are being fulfilled today. As we look around, we think, yes, that's amazing. Even the words and the terminology and the way that God described these prophetic events, we see them taking place in the world today. And it can be a little bit unnerving, perhaps even scary, but the book of Revelation is blessed by God. It's not there to scare us, it's there to prepare us, to get us ready. And yet I think that in my own personal life I struggle. I mentioned um, the struggle I had with gaining weight, for example, <laughs> which I know some of you can't relate to, but it's, it's been a real struggle for me for many years. And it was interesting because we moved down to Loma Linda temporarily in August, and when I got there, uh, I weighed 155, which is about 10 pounds, give or take, more than I used to weigh when I was really underweight. In other words, I had lost a lot of weight. I had been failing to exercise, and I had lost a lot of weight. And I, I didn't feel good about that. I felt like, you know, when I travel, I lose weight anyway, for various reasons, and so, but where we're living in Loma Linda, we just, we just step outside of our door and we look down the road and there's this place called the Drayson Center. And the Drayson Center is like this exercise place. And my wife is a student at Loma Linda, so we get to go to the Drayson Center for free. We're just members. And I said, I'm going to start going to the Drayson Center and working out again. And something about exercise that's really interesting, I don't know if you know this, I started exercising intensely in, well, I was 39, so I don't know when that was, but it was many years ago. And, uh, and it took a long time to really get in shape. It, I told you it took me a year to gain 10 pounds. 
And so now I'm down to 155 pounds, and I haven't exercised consistently for many months. And I started going to the Drayson Center again every single day. And, you know, it was, it was kind of humiliating because I was, you know, I was way be behind where I used to be, cardiovascular, strength-wise, et cetera. But I said, I'm going to do this. But here's the interesting thing. Because I had been exercising consistently, even though I had quit, once I started again, it was much faster, it was much quicker to actually get back up to where I used to be. Right now, I weigh 175 pounds. So from August to now, I have gained, let's see, 55, 65, 20 pounds. Now, it took me a year when I first started to gain 10 pounds. But just in just six months, I gained 20 pounds. And I feel good again. I feel strong again. I feel like I'm, you know, back in shape again. I, I can handle these long flights and these cold climates because I've got a little bit of insulation on me and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. What I basically realized in this illustration is Sometimes we backslide. Sometimes we're not as spiritual, f spiritually fit as we once were, or perhaps as we could have been if we kept exercising our spiritual muscles. And we can kind of get discouraged. We can kind of think, ah, you know. But I've learned that just like exercise, picking up the habit again, you actually get a lot further, a lot faster than when you first started. It's not like you're going all the way back to the beginning, but you do have to start back at those beginning principles. I'm thinking about this in relation to a verse in the book of Hebrews, if you want to open up there with me to Hebrews chapter 5. And this is really on target. How do you prepare? How do we prepare for final events? Now, we're going to be looking at some verses in prophecy that I think uh, are to the point but they're still along these lines because we've been studying prophecy and I don't want to jump clear out of prophecy and say, well, the way you prepare is over here. These verses, I want to stay right in the line of prophecy and understand how in the context of prophecy, God is telling us to prepare. So, but Hebrews chapter 5, just to get us going here, beginning with verse 12, Paul is speaking here to, I think, the Hebrews specifically. And it's interesting because when you look at the history of the Hebrew nation, you find that that they're a lot like us. And when I say us, I'm talking about Adventists. They were given, you know, the commandments and the law and the sanctuary and all of these truths. And they had this knowledge, this intellectual knowledge that set them apart, perhaps, from the rest of the nations. And yet they failed, to some degree or another, to have this relationship with Christ, this intimate, abiding relationship with God. And so when you look at the book of Hebrews, Paul has this burden for the Hebrews. He has this burden for the Israelites. And you'll recognize as you read the book of Hebrews, it's a very relational book. There's not a lot of doctrine in that book. And if it is there, if, if Paul does talk about the sanctuary, which he does a lot in here, a lot of it has to do with breaking down the symbolism of the sanctuary to lead to relationship with Christ. What did that mean? What did the holy place mean? What did the most holy place mean? What was the priesthood all about? It was all about this relationship. In fact, he opens up the book of Hebrews saying, God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past to our, to our fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken unto us by his son. See, it's, it's, it's communication. It's relationship. You know, if you have a relationship with someone, you speak with them. If, if you don't have a relationship with someone, you, you don't speak with them, Right? I know this because there's, there are times when my wife and I have um, intense moments of fellowship. <laughs> and we may go to sleep, you know, and she'll be on one side of the, the king size bed that we sleep in, and I'm on the other side. And there's enough room between us for both of our children. <laughs> And I'm going to sleep, and she's going to sleep, and my wife is a communicator. I'm, I'm kind of like, the, the way I operate is, you know, everything will be good in the morning. So just stuff it. And so I don't want to talk about it. I'll, be, I'll feel better in the morning. You'll feel better. It'll all be gone, and we can wake up, smile, and, you know. But she's not that way. She knows better than that, and I know better than that now, but, you know, I'm not always ready to admit that. So I know she wants to talk before we go to sleep. And of course, I can't sleep either, but I try to sleep and I pretend I'm sleeping. So when she asked me, James, you know, are you awake? 
I don't answer because if I answer, then she'll think I'm awake, but I'm asleep. At least I want her to think I'm asleep. So, so we're there and, you know, she'll persist and finally I'll say, no, I'm not awake, I'm asleep. <laughs> and we'll begin to talk. Communicate. When there's no communication, that means there's a problem, there's an issue. And so God is saying here, I know you may have a problem, but I don't have a problem. God has always communicated. He's always been a communicator. He's initiated communication. He's been speaking to us in sundry times and in divers manners. I love the King James Version of the Bible because we don't have a clue what that means, but it sure sounds beautiful, doesn't it? Sundry times and divers manners. It means in every way and in every variety of way he can, he's communicated to us through the prophets. And in the last days, he communicated by his son, Jesus Christ. So it's all about relationship. That's how we prepare. That's how we get ready. And so Paul is earnest about this in the book of Hebrews. And he says to these former uh, backslidden or backsliding Seventh-day Adventists, in verse 12 of Hebrews 5, he says, For when for the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God. You are become such as have need of milk, and not of strong meat. Now just pause there for a second. When I go to work out at the gym, and I haven't been in the gym for a long time, and I haven't been working out for a long time, and I haven't been exercising for a long time, I can go in there, I've got a chart and an outline, I can say, well, this is what I used to press, or this is what I used to run, and so I'm just gonna do it again. It's not gonna work. I'm gonna, I'm gonna kill myself. I'm gonna hurt myself if I try to do that. And I've tried to, you know, pretend that it just doesn't happen. I've got to go back. I've got to take weight off. I've got to take time off. I've got to start back here and then build up again. And I tell people that. I said, if you haven't been walking with the Lord for a while, don't just forget everything you know and start all over again. Go right back to the very beginning. All that stuff will come back, but you start with Christ today from the foot of the cross. You accept Christ as your Savior today. And today, you read his word and forget what he's told you in the past. You haven't been there for a year, two years, months, whatever. And just let him convict you today of what it is that he wants you to do today. And then continue to read and continue to grow and continue to learn as you build strength. Sure enough, all of that other stuff will come back into place. So he says, you need to go back to the beginning. Notice verse 13. For everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But, verse 14, strong meat belongs to them who are full of age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. So there's this principle here that he's talking about, and he goes on to elaborate on it in, in chapter 6. He's talking about how that when we don't exercise, when we don't spiritually exercise, we're not strong. And because we're not strong, even though we ought to be strong, we ought to be teachers, we need to go back. We need to go back to babyhood. We need to go back to the milk. And as we go back to that milk, we develop strength, we gain, and then the strong meat comes. So I think for all of us, there are times well, maybe not for all of us, but for me, there are times when I need to go back to the milk, when I need to go back to basics, so to speak, and allow God to teach me again the first oracles, the foundation of, of the oracles, of the teachings of God. And I think it's good for all of us. Um, I see this in the book of Revelation, and I just want us to, to look at it again from an overview in relation to our subject this afternoon and that is how to prepare for final events. What is the first thing we need in preparing for final events? Revelation chapter 1 and verse 1. What is the first thing we need in preparing for final events? The revelation of Jesus Christ. It's the first thing we need. The book of Revelation has been given to us. I believe the book of Revelation is the distillation of the entire Bible. The book of Revelation has been given to us so that we can be ready for final events. Now, if you understand that, this is a special book given, of course, to all of God's people from John's time onward, but especially applicable to God's people in the end of time, especially. The revelation of Jesus Christ, here's how you get ready for the future. It's an outline. It's a step-by-step -step outline. Whatever you do, do not jump into Revelation chapter 13 
and think you're going to be ready for end time events. And do not take other people and plop them into Revelation 13 and think they're going to be ready for end time events. Now I know we've done that to a degree here because we've had a shorter, more intense study time with a special emphasis. But I'm now, now we're getting to the meeting where we prepare for all the things we've talked about. So we kind of put the cart before the horse, so to speak. But now we're going back and we're saying, okay, how do we get ready for all those things we've been talking about? Well, the book of Revelation tells us how to get ready. If God wanted us to be in Revelation 13 from the get-go, he would have put it in chapter 1 of Revelation, but he didn't, right? He put Jesus first. In fact, there is no dragon in the first half of the book of Revelation. Just pause on that for a bit. Sila. Just think about that. There's no dragon in the first half of the book of Revelation. There's no beast coming up out of the earth in the first half of the book of Revelation. Or out of the sea, excuse me, or the earth. There's one coming out of the bottomless pit. That's in Revelation 11. But still, it's almost halfway through the book before we encounter any of those beasts or dragons or any of that type of ter terminology. And by the way, here's something that might surprise you, but maybe not. There are no commandment keepers in the first half of the book of Revelation. There's no mention of a people who keep the commandments of God in the first half of the book of Revelation. Because beasts and dragons and commandment keeping and the conflict is something that God holds until we're ready for it. Ready to encounter it. And in order to get ready, well you know the words of that song. Anywhere with Jesus I can safely go. Anywhere, anywhere, fear I cannot know. Before we encounter any of that, we need an encounter with Jesus. That's, that's what the book of Revelation is actually explaining to us. That's the way it's written. It says the revelation of Jesus. God is giving this unto him. It's from him, verse 5, who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. The first thing that John sees, the first vision he sees, the first thing, the first person he sees is Jesus. Doesn't see a beast, doesn't see him. He sees Jesus. The first message he gets is the message of the gospel. I love you. I've washed you from my sins. I've done this for the world. I want you to focus on me and I want you to know the message of my love. That'll get you ready for the beast. That'll get you ready for the dragon, but I'm not done yet. I understand all of your weakness, all of your failures, all of your faults, Revelation 7 churches. I know you from A to Z. In fact, those of you who are living in the last days, you really make me want to oh, upchuck. You really nauseate me because you have this attitude of being rich and increased with goods in need of, but I love you. I'm with you. I'm among the churches. So, don't hide from God. Don't hide your failures, faults, imperfections. I know we hide them from each other. I hide them from my wife. She hides them from me. And, and it is hard because sometimes when we reveal our failures to even people that are close to us, they don't quite treat us as God would treat us. They don't quite, quite relate to us the way that maybe God would. And we don't want to spoil that. You know, it's difficult for us to be real with one another because, mm, you know, it lowers people's estimation. I mean, I, we could spend the rest of this time, I could just tell you all the things about myself. That, but as you realize that Jesus Christ is the one that we please, he's the one that weighs the heart. He's the one that we are to stand in front of, not each other, but his judgment seat, and that he loves us, and that he longs to reveal so that he can heal rather than condemn, we gain security. It, it becomes okay. We become healthy. And we're okay with the way other people see us or don't see us or know us or don't know us because we have a Savior who sees and understands and accepts us. And he's the author and the finisher of us. And he's going to take care of all of that. And so we become freer. We become more able to handle the criticism and the fault finding, the negativism and all of the other things because we see Jesus now and we claim his promises. And, and even though he reminds us through the Spirit, overcome, 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 we're not overwhelmed by that. Why? Because he's showing us how this works. He tells us in Revelation chapter 5, you know, there's no man in heaven, there's no man on earth, and there's no man under the earth that can overcome. That's what John is told. And he begins to weep. And then the elder comes to him and says, weep not. Behold the lion of the tribe of Judah. I'm reading Revelation chapter 5 right now. Verse 5. Behold the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David. He has prevailed. He has prevailed. And that same word, same word, Nikaeo, the same word that's used for overcome through all the churches. What we need is what Jesus Christ has done. He's prevailed. Well, we have 
failed. And so then the book of Revelation moves into chapter 6. Jesus begins to unseal the scroll. One seal is broken after another. And by the way, the lamb opens the seals. Calvary, the cross, reveals the mysteries of the seals, those things that we don't understand. And as he opens the first one, there's this white horse and its rider. And of course, Zechariah chapter 10 explains that we are the horse. And of course, Revelation 19 explains that Jesus is the rider of the white horse. In other words, the horse is a symbol of people. There are four horses in Revelation 6 because we have four as a symbol of the four corners of the earth, just like the four winds. There's, there's more than four angels holding four winds, but we've got north, south, east, and west. We've got the whole world being symbolized by the four winds. We've got the whole world being symbolized by the four horses. And those four horses represent our response to the unsealing of history as it relates to the Lamb, Jesus Christ. He has prevailed. He's taken the scroll. He's unrolling that scroll. He's unrolling that history. And the first thing we see is this white horse and its rider. That represents the God's church, the apostolic church. The, the white represents God's people. And the rider, of course, is Jesus because God's people are united with Christ. They're connected with Christ. They've given him the reins. And he is directing them. And as we connect with Jesus, as he becomes our rider, as he, as he takes the reins of our lives, we go forth conquering and to conquer. We need to overcome. We can overcome. Jesus is overcome. As we connect with him, we go forth to conquer and to overcome. That's the message that we have here. In other words, everything centers in Christ. It's all about connecting with Christ. Not being overwhelmed by where we fail, but putting our trust in where he prevails, not where we have failed. And then we move on, and, and as you go through the horses, it's really interesting. Parallel them with the, the parable of the sower and the seed. It's a perfect parallel. Because the seed is the, the sower and the seed is the seed is sown into the world. The world is the field. And you have how many types of ground? Four. How many horses? How many types of ground are good ground? One. How many horses are good? One. How many are bad ground? Three. How many horses are bad? Three. It's a perfect parallel. Jesus is teaching the same thing in the horses that we see being taught in the parable of the sower and the seed. And parables are symbolic, just like these revelation is symbolic. And he repeats now, and by the way, before he goes into the trumpets, it's really powerful, he gives a picture of those who are going to be saved in heaven. Just, just to encourage us. In Revelation 7 verse 9, he says, John says, After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude. I love these next five words. King James. Which no man could number. Isn't that powerful? That's beautiful gospel truth there. And he does it in just the right place. Because he's just finished describing the ceiling of the 144,000. And you know how we are. We're thinking, yeah, 144,000, that's a pretty small number. That's what we're thinking. And the idea some of us get is, you know, God is standing at the pearly gates, 143,997. That's Shelley, 143,998. That's JD, 143,990, 144,000. Who's... Oh. All right, Bill, we'll let you in. That's it. Sorry, folks. <laughs> no more room. That's the idea we get sometimes. And so John immediately has shown a company that no man could number. And guess where they are? Because we think, oh, a company that no man can number, that must be the lost. <laughs> that must be the people outside. No, they're standing before the throne. And that's the question that was asked. Who's going to be able to stand when he comes and before the Lamb? And they have palms in their hands and white robes. And they cry with what kind of a voice? A loud voice. Of course. We're not going to be quiet then. We're quiet now. We're not going to be quiet then. And what is their cry? Salvation to our God. Now, the reason we're so quiet about that is because we're not sure at this point if salvation is to our God or if it's to him and us. And so we sit in our pews and we think, well, I know that God loves me and that he saved me, but I also know that if I'm, I'm here, I've got to be here in order to be saved. No, I've got to pay a tithe in order to be saved. I've got to eat my veggie dogs in order to be saved. Whatever it is. You see what I'm saying? But a time is coming where we're going to figure it out. Salvation is to our God because we're going to realize none of that other stuff that we did actually merited our salvation. We're going to realize that. Does, that. does that mean we shouldn't do it? Well, it depends. <laughs> it depends on why you do it. If you're doing it to merit your salvation, yeah, it's about time you quit. But if you are doing it because you have fallen in love with Jesus, because there's no other way to live, 
but the way he wants you to live and do, but the things he wants you to do, then you're going to keep doing it. It's not going to make any difference that that doesn't save you. <laughs> that has nothing to do with it. You have a Savior, and you love him, and you want to do what pleases him. And by the way, what pleases him is what's best for you. It's best for you too. So it's like a win-win situation. <laughs> But the love has to be that. That's why the first church is, you know, you've got works and faith and you tried those that say they're apostles and they're not, but you've lost your first love. And all that other stuff you're doing isn't going to make, it's not going to get you through. That's the first church message, last church message. And here we are being reminded of this truth over and over again in the book of Revelation. It's righteousness by faith in Jesus Christ. It's trusting in him for salvation. It's a gift. He gives it to us as a gift. We can't merit it. We can't earn it. And when we realize that, it, gra it grabs our hearts. It motivates us. It takes over. Do we need to realize that at least once in our life? No, it's not good enough. We need this realization to be re repeated every single moment of our Christian experience. Otherwise, it'll be ripped out of our hands. Our natural inclination is to trust in our righteousness. It's to trust in ourselves. And, and, and Jesus warns us about this. If you look at this in Luke chapter 18, it's really interesting because Christ is talking about whether or not he's going to find faith when he comes back. This is a, an end time prophetic verse. It fits perfectly with how we prepare for final events. Luke 18, he says, verse 8, I tell you that he will avenge him speedily. Nevertheless, it's halfway through the verse. Verse 8 of Luke 18. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? It's a prophetic question. He's talking about his second coming. Will he find faith on the earth? Will he find the people who keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus? Will he find that? And then, verse 9, he spoke a parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous. So the contrast here is really interesting because in Revelation, we're preparing to meet the dragon. We're preparing to meet the beast. We're preparing to meet the final crisis. And in that preparation, there's no emphasis on those entities or even on commandment keeping. The entire emphasis is building toward a faith relationship with Jesus and trusting in his righteousness. So we go back here to Luke 18. Will he find faith on the earth? Then he talks about a group of people who trust in themselves that they're righteous. And you're thinking, how can I know? It's so difficult sometimes, especially when you want to do what God wants you to do. How can you know if you're actually trusting in yourself or you're trusting in Jesus? I mean, that's a good question, isn't it? Well, here's where Jesus gives us the answer. It's a beautiful answer. It's a simple answer, but it's... Well, let me just read it to you, and you'll, tell, you'll, 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 you'll know what it is. Verse 9 again, Luke 18, and he spoke... This parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. There it is. That's how you can know. You can know if you're trusting in yourself, in your works, in your righteousness, if you despise other people. Now that's deep. That's heavy. That, that says, how do you feel about Baptists? Catholics, Muslims, Obama. <laughs> not the health care, you understand, that's a thing, that's not a person, right? <laughs> you can not like that if you don't want to, that's okay. But people, people for whom Christ died. How did Christ feel about people? Were there certain people that Christ hated? Think about it. For whom he did not die? Because we are Christians. Christians. And honestly, I have to say, I'm not there yet. There are people I don't like. I just don't. I don't like the way they treat me, or I don't like the way they look at me, or I don't like their interaction with me, or I don't like the history I have with them. And I have to praise the Lord and say, wow, I'm still trusting to some degree in my righteousness. And when I know that I'm saved totally by the grace of God, that but for the grace of God, there go I, 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 I. That's me. And my righteousness is completely decimated then I know, finally, God has taken it all out. All of it is gone, and I'm ready. I'm ready for the crisis, because when that crisis comes, my test is to gather warmth from the coldness of other and courage from their cowardice. My test is going to be to, to give kindness, to turn the other cheek, to go the extra mile in the face of all of that. <laughs> if I'm not doing that now, how am I ever going to do it then? It's got to be completely 100% trust in Christ and not in me. So I'm thankful that, that I 
have some a gauge that tells me how I can know I'm trusting myself. And red flag goes up, red light goes up, and it reminds me when I judge someone else, when I think negatively of someone else, it reminds me, oh, there's a fiber of Babylon there. There's a fiber of self-righteousness there. God wants you to know and understand it. And then he, of course, is going to, you can't remove it. You can't love others by trying to love others. What you need is the love of Christ in the heart. So that's the focus. That's what we want to focus. And that's what Revelation does. It's so beautiful. It's so powerful. John then opens up the seven trumpets and he gives us this picture. It's a picture of an angel with, it says, verse 3, a golden censer. And he's given much incense that he offers it with the prayers of the saints upon the golden altar which is before the throne. And the smoke, verse 4 of Revelation 8, of the incense comes with the prayers of the saints and it ascends up before God out of the angel's hand. Now this picture is beautiful because so far we've seen the incarnation of Jesus, Revelation 7 churches, he's with us. We've seen the crucifixion of Jesus, Revelation's seals, Christ crucified in the midst of the throne, the lamb slain in the midst of the throne. And now we're seeing the intercession of Jesus. The angel, the incense, the prayers of the saints be mingled with the incense. And by the way, even though in Revelation chapters 4 and 5, incense, especially in 5, represents the prayers of the saints, in Revelation 8, incense represents the merit of Jesus because it's being mingled with the prayers of the saints. It would be redundant for the prayers of the saints to be mingled with the prayers of the saints. So according to Ephesians 5, 2, that Christ's sacrifice for us is a sweet-smelling savor, a sweet-smelling incense, and that's what's being depicted here. That the incense, the righteousness of Christ, is, is mingled with our prayers. And we need it desperately, don't we? Especially now that we've realized that when we despise other people, it's it's an evidence that we're trusting in our righteousness. So our prayers go up and we say, oh Lord, please forgive me for trusting in my righteousness. Or our prayer goes up like in in Luke 18. You remember the prayer of the the publican and the the Pharisee? The Pharisee says, oh, I'm so thankful that I'm not a Baptist and I'm not a Catholic and I'm not a Muslim and I'm not a Hindu. I'm so thankful I'm not like that guy over there. I fast twice a week. I pay tithe of all that business. I'm so thankful I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. How far up do you think that prayer goes? Well, the, it, the, the context of it says the guy prayed to himself. <laughs> so God doesn't hear prayers when, they pray, when you pray to yourself. <laughs> anyway, though he does hear them. We know he hears all prayers. But we need, our prayers need the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Our prayers are still tainted with selfishness. I mean, there are good reasons why I'm up here at 3 a.m. You know, I want to preach the gospel. I love the gospel. I love preaching the truth. And then there are other reasons, selfish reasons. You know, I'm on 3 a.m. I'm a speaker on 3 a.m. Right? All of us have those issues that we're dealing with, the things that God is working out through our characters and our growth and and sometimes it can be overwhelming I remember one year I said Lord show me myself just go ahead show me myself yeah I can handle it boy that was a tough year that was a tough year and you know I I rarely will watch or listen to myself because I'm like man I am so vain you know what I'm saying that whole thing you're just like uh I wish I could be more like Jesus well I have to trust him for that I can't give up you can't give up there's nothing you know the disciples left Jesus in John 6 and Jesus turned to his 12 and he said, are you going to go? And they said, where are we going to go? What, what options are there other than following Jesus? I mean, I've been there. I've done that. I've experienced it. I mean, it's, it just, it's empty. It's void. There is nothing but Jesus, really. He's our hope. And so, you know, if he's willing to finish the work and if he's not going to give up on me, I'm certainly, I don't want to give up on him. Though I think I would do that before he did on me. And I praise him for that. Praise God that we have that Savior. And so Revelation chapter 8 reveals this this righteousness that is given to us. Revelation chapter 10 uh, builds on that a little bit. I don't want to go into that. I want to get to Revelation 12 because we're going to run out of time. Revelation chapter 12. What do we have here? We have a wonder. We have a sign. This is our destiny. Revelation 12 verse 1 is our destiny. Now, I'm not going to deny that Revelation 12, 17 is not our destiny or Revelation 14, 12 is not our destiny. What I'm going to suggest is, is that many times when we think about preparing for final events, we point to the commandments and keeping the commandments and keeping the Sabbath day and having that as the seal of God, having that day, and we neglect the other prophetic verses that are not only included, but precede. 
those verses. What I mean by that is, before we get to Revelation 12, 17, we get to Revelation 12, 1. And I think that is depicting our experience. This is our walk. This is our experience. God wants us to get to Revelation 12, 1 before, that's why he put it there, before Revelation 12, 17. In our experience, he wants us to be, notice, and there appeared a great wonder, sign, something out of the ordinary in heaven, a woman. What does a woman represent in Bible prophecy? A church, a pure woman, God's church, uh, uh, an apostate woman, an apostate church. Uh, uh, and this woman is clothed with the sun, and she is standing on the moon, and she has a crown of 12 stars on her head. Oh, what a picture is this. The sun, according to Malachi 4 verse 2, represents the righteousness of Jesus Christ. He is the sun, S-U-N, of righteousness in Malachi 4 2. So here you have a church that is clothed with the righteousness of Jesus Christ. This is before they keep the commandments. See, when I came to Jesus, when I got on my knees, I said, Lord, please come into my heart, forgive me for my sins, take those sins, give me your forgiveness. See, in that moment, I didn't have any clue about Adventism or the Saturday Sabbath or anything like that. I was raised a Catholic. I learned how to accept Christ as my Savior. I asked him to come into my heart. He took my sins. He gave me his righteousness, and I was clothed with the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Didn't even know about commandment keeping. I was this before I was this. Now, some of us are raised Adventists, and we are this before we're that. I'm talking about verse 1 and verse 17. We get the cart before the horse. We've got to get back to chapter 12. We've got to go in Hebrews to chapter 5 before we go on to chapter 6. We have to go back to the basics. They have to come first. And God works sometimes in difficult and challenging ways to get us to that place where he is the foundation. And then we're standing on the moon. Now, the moon to me is, you know, Psalm 119, 105, the moon to me. The Bible teaches <laughs> that the moon represents the word of God. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path, or a light unto my feet, a lamp unto my path. It's one or the other, but it's Psalm 119, 105. In other words, God wants us to be clothed with Christ's righteousness and standing on his word. And then the crown of 12 stars, I believe, represents the kingdom number. We are, we are to be lights shining, 12 Old Testament tribes, New Testament apostles. We'll talk about that a little bit when we get to Daniel. Now, now, okay, think about this. We've just come to the halfway point in the Bible. I mean, in the book of Revelation. We're right, we're halfway, okay? There are 22 chapters. We've just finished Revelation 11, 19. By the way, the, the, the center of the book of Revelation is Revelation 12 where it says, and, and I'm just gonna read it to you here. Verse 10, and I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, now has come salvation, strength, and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. That's the halfway point of Revelation. If you count the words in English and in Greek on each side, that's the halfway point. It's the cross up and Satan cast down. That's the center of it all. Okay, so we just got to the halfway point. The focus of the halfway point, no commandments yet, no beast yet, well, one beast, but no dragon, nothing, no crisis yet, mark of the beast yet. The focus here of this halfway point is we're clothed with Christ's righteousness, we're standing on his word. When you are clothed with Christ's righteousness, standing on his word and part of his church, 12 stars, now you're ready. Now you're ready, but wait a minute, hold on just a second. Just so we get this clear, Revelation 12, 11. Here it is. And they overcame him by what? The blood of the Lamb, the word of their testimony, and they love not their lives unto the death. Self is gone. Self is dead. Self is gone. They're just, they're 100% clothed with his righteousness. They're depending on the blood of the Lamb. They have a testimony, and you can't have a testimony unless you have an experience in a relationship with Jesus. Nothing to talk about. But if you're connected with him, if you're connected with the NFL, you're talking about football. If you're connected with cars, you're talking about cars. Right? Whatever you connect with, that's what comes out. Whatever it is you spend your time doing, that's what's going to come out of your mouth. That's what's going to be on your brain. These guys are connected with Jesus, and that's what they're talking about. Jesus, 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 Jesus. You wouldn't believe this. You know, da, 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 da. It's just a testimony that's just is coming out of them. And what do they overcome? Verse 10, I heard a loud voice 
saying in heaven, now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ for the accuser of our brethren is cast down which accused them before God day and night. They overcome the accuser. Now this is significant because they're not just overcoming the accuser like you're a sinner, you're no good, you can't do anything. They're overcoming the accuser who says, through us, you are this, that, and the other. In other words, we are no longer pointing the finger. Jesus says they will know you because you lo have love one for another. I think the biggest thing that is eating out our evangelistic outreach in the church is our judgmental, critical, gossipy tongues. We just can't stop talking about each other. And the reason we can't stop talking about each other is because we are insecure. And we're insecure because we don't have Christ's righteousness. And we don't have Christ's righteousness because we don't think we're good enough. And we'll never be good enough. That's why he gives us his righteousness. And when we shed that and realize it and take a hold of it, we will no longer be grabbing people by the throat and saying, pay me what you owe me. You understand what I'm saying? We're going into God on our terms. God says, hey, you've got a big debt here, and you're gonna, I'm going to have to hold you accountable for it. You're going to have to pay it. And we say to him, servant, right? M Matthew 18, give me time. I'll pay the whole thing, right? And God has compassion. He says, I forgive you. We're like, oh, good. And then we go out, and what do we do? We grab someone by the throat, and we say, you need to pay me. Why do we, why do we, why do we think that that person needs to pay us? Because we, we went in with our terms. Our terms were, give me time and I'll pay you. Oh, you got, okay, now I got some time. I got to pay him. We missed the whole point. And the whole point was he forgave us because he had compassion on us. And he wants us to do the same thing. That's the point. That's the gospel. And the gospel just does change the life. And if we don't grab the gospel, it won't change the life. And so we'll be just the same. And so Jesus says, I've got a people now. Now that I've got this people that are clothed in my righteousness, standing on my word, overcoming by my blood, the accusing is gone. They've got a testimony about Jesus. They're not in it, they're not in it for themselves. Self is forgotten. Now I've got a people who keep the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus. Revelation 12, 17, there they are. Here they are. If you love me, keep my commandments. Why do we love him? Because he first loved us. It's, it's all there. Revelation is a masterpiece not because of its prophetic declarations only, but because it is a basic outline of the plan of salvation and how we get ready, how we can be ready for the second coming of Jesus. And that manifestation, the, the, the preparation that we make is to focus on Christ. And Revelation chapter 14, notice this, the beast power is introduced in chapter 13. We've got all the warfare coming against us, all the deception coming against us. Everything's coming against us. No man's going to be able to buy or sell. Economic boycott is coming down. It's going to be heavy. It's going to be hard. It's going to be fast. It's going to be overwhelming. But out of all of this, Revelation 14, John looked and behold, a lamb stood on Mount Zion and with him 144,000 having the Father's name written in their foreheads. How did it get there? We're going to find that out in a second. And I heard a voice from heaven, if we haven't figured it out already, same with a loud voice, excuse me, a voice, I heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many waters, verse 2, as the voice of a great thunder, as the voice of harpers harping with their harps, and they sang, as it were, a new song before the throne and before the four beasts. I want to learn that song, don't you? Amen. And the elders and no man could learn that song but the 144,000 which were redeemed from the earth. These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb wherever he goes. They're just following Jesus, following Jesus, following Jesus. They were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits to God and to the Lamb, and in their mouth was no guile for they are without fault before the throne of God. And I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven having the everlasting gospel. Do you see the connection here? They've, here they are. Here, here they are. And amidst all of that crisis and all of that terror of Revelation 13, there's a people who have their names written in the Lamb's Book of Life and their focus is Christ. And they're going to deliver a message. And it's not going to be terrifying for them because they're just sold out for Jesus just what they do. They can't help themselves. 
they weigh the consequences, they think about it, but then they just, they, it just, they just say, yeah, what else can I do? I just have to live for Jesus. They're filled with his spirit. Look at it in Daniel. Daniel has a, another way of presenting the same truth, this beautiful picture that we see in Revelation is also filled out in the book of Daniel. It might be a little bit different in the way that it's approached, but in Daniel chapter 12, you have this picture. Now, this is interesting because we're going to look at the last verse of the prophetic picture of Daniel. Now, remember this morning we talked a little bit about, you know, Daniel 2, Daniel 7, Daniel 8, Daniel 11. And I said there were two principles that could help us to understand end time prophecy, coming economic control, and the connection between Daniel and Revelation. Now, I mentioned, of course, one of those principles was that if we could find another prophetic section of Scripture that had the same outline, Daniel 2, Daniel 7, Daniel 8, Daniel 11, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, and the second coming, second coming, second coming, second coming. Remember that was one of the principles we talked about? But I didn't tell you if there was another section of Scripture. And I was wondering, did anyone figure out if there is another section of Scripture that, that actually goes through that same outline? Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome. And then takes us further and outlines in more detail events in the end of time that aren't clear in Daniel 11, 40 to 45, but actually could become clearer if we compared the two. Yeah, there is. There, there actually is another prophetic section of the Bible that has the same outline that we see in Daniel 2, Daniel 7, Daniel 8, and Daniel 11. And you know what that prophetic section is? Revelation 13. I think Revelation 13 doesn't talk about Babylon and Medo-Persia and Greece and Rome. Does it? Think. I saw another beast coming out of the sea and it had... Seven heads and ten horns. Right? Nations of Europe. John's looking back now. And the beast that I saw had a body like a leopard, Greece. And it had feet like the feet of a bear, meat of Persia. And it had the mouth as the mouth of, it, mouth of a lion, Babylon. There it is. The whole first half of Revelation 13 is a prophetic glance back in history to the same basic outline of Daniel 2, 7, 8, and 11. And then after the wound is inflicted, which is 1798, time of the end, we see the rise of another power that allies with this. They have a holy alliance. They connect together, this second power that rises up out of the earth and the first one, and they continue now to dominate the world. So if you look at Revelation chapter 13 verses 11 through 18, you can parallel them perfectly with Daniel chapter 11 verses 40 to 45 and onward. It's a perfect parallel. And there are, there are a number of connections that we see there. We made a few of them today. But I just wanted to, to, to get to that because I'm not sure I covered that. And of course we're running out of time again here. But hopefully, I, I, I'm hoping, I'm planning, I'm praying about coming back next year and doing another series just focusing on Daniel 11 and opening up those verses. There's a lot of information there and a lot of stuff we need to look at and we can take more time on it. But I want us to look at one thing right here in Daniel 12 and verse 3. It's the last verse of the prophetic picture that God gives Daniel because in verse 4, Daniel's told to close up the book. It's, it's kind of like a, um, a prologue. A close. Okay, close up the book. It's going to be sealed for this many years. Then you're going to stand your lot. So verses 4 through 13 are just instruction to Daniel. But verse 3 is still part of the vision that he's given, the, in the interpretation that he's given at least of Daniel 11. And so in verse 3, you could actually say that, that verse 3, 2, and 1 should be part of Daniel 11. And then verse 4 should be Daniel 12. It should start with verse 4, really, in, in the context of how it flows. So the last thing Daniel is told, this is it, this is it. It's closing out the whole thing. All of his visions are closing out with this thought. They that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness at the stars forever and ever. Amen. That's it. That's what he's told. They that be wise and then it's kind of a repeat. They that be righteous shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as stars forever and ever. Now in Jeremiah chapter 23 and verse 6, we are told that Jesus Christ is the Lord our righteousness. So sometimes we put these big words in there and we're like, well, what is righteousness? Jesus is righteousness. 
Jesus is our righteousness. So you could actually read this verse. I'm going to read it this way. They that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to Jesus as the stars forever and ever. See, that's the bottom line. To direct people to Jesus. To get out of the way so people can see Jesus. So the weaker you are, the more faulty you are, the more you fail, the more opportunity you're going to have to reveal Jesus. If you allow yourself to just be humbled and let Jesus just shine through. The more of you that's there, the less of Jesus people are going to see. I'm fully aware of that in my own life and experience. But the more we fall on our face and the more we just put our hearts out there and give it to Jesus, the more people are going to have the opportunity to see what Jesus can do with us and in spite of us. And one last verse that I want you to look at here that I think is really powerful because it says everyone that's, that's going to be delivered is going to be written in the book. Malachi chapter 3, verse 16. Then they that feared the Lord spake often one to another, and the Lord hearkened and heard it, and a book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared the Lord and thought upon his name. They shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts. In that day when I make up my jewels, I will spare them as a man spares his own son that serves him. They will be mine. So when we look at this, when we, when we recognize that the prophecies come right down to the very end and direct us to Jesus and direct us to direct others to Jesus, that it's all about Jesus, we realize that the book of Revelation is the revelation of Jesus. It's not the revelation of the beast or the dragon. It's not the revelation of the judgments. It's the revelation. Satan has stolen this book. He has made this book a, a, a scary book, a terrifying book. We need to take it back. It's not his, it's ours. It's our book, and we want it back, right? We want it back because God has a blessing in it, and I'm tired of hearing Christians say, I don't read Revelation. I'm scared of Revelation. I don't want anything to do with Revelation. This is God's book, and it's for us, and it prepares us, not scares us. And we've got to know what's in it because God has blessed it, and he wants to bless us with it. Amen? Yeah.